Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's been a while, but I hope you are staying safe. My name is Elwood, and welcome to another edition of Rock On Studio Live, the only show that gets you one-on-one -on -one with all of your favorite rock stars, everybody in the music industry, and more. And don't forget, if you got a question or a comment, drop it in the comment section. We'll get it on the screen, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And if you haven't clicked subscribe yet, make sure you do it, because I got to eat. So please help me out. And you can check out all the past interviews. Plus, you get reminders for the up and coming ones. We saw a lot more and some that I can't even talk about right now. So don't miss out. Rock on Studio Live on YouTube and Twitch. Simply click subscribe and you'll be good. All right. On the show today is somebody that I look up to. I've looked up to for many, many years. I am honored uh, to have him with us. He is a nationally syndicated radio host for rock. He's been doing it for three decades. He is an author. He is a photographer. He is a doggy dad. He is a husband. I don't. He's pretty much everything. I, it, his only resume that I know that just your occupation would be a paragraph. So he's always got something to, good to talk about. And he's got his book, Sonic Warrior, out now. Without further ado, joining me live in the Rock On studio, my good friend, Mr. Lou Brutus. How are you, Will, my brother? And uh, oh, now you're shy. Now you don't want to get on camera. I have I, Delta the Wonder Dog with me. Darla, as can, beautiful. As you can oh, there she is, right, right with her sign. Um, she she's running for office. Uh, she doesn't want to be president per se. Uh, she just wants to be in charge. Do you want to get down already? Are you <laughs> going to be wicked? Now you can't be crazy bad puppies. She's um, she's wrecked a number of book appearances I've done <laughs> there where she just thought she should be getting rough. Well, well, you're going to knock the camera over. Now what are you doing? How many? Uh, do you we'll actually have a quickly? We'll 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 see how well behaved she'll be. But yeah, sometimes she she throws fits and she thinks she's not getting enough attention or treats. So uh, Darla uh, takes over. But anyway, the lawn signs behind me you can find them all over my neighborhood where I live. So uh, Dar Darla's uh, counting on the neighborhood vote. But uh, how you doing? How's everybody holding up in uh, in Chi Town? It's good, man. Slowly uh, trying to get back to normal. Good news is we are one of the great states that is actually uh, doing well with COVID-19. So it's awesome. Uh, a lot of people wearing masks, taking all the precautions and doing what we're supposed to do. And now we just wait like everybody else. We are waiting. And we talked about this a little bit before. I saw a meme that said I would do anything to go to a concert right now. And someone says, put on a mask and say, but I don't want to. It's that simple. It's that simple. So everyone just continue to be safe and we'll get back to concerts and more. We all want. Yeah, to Yeah, I, I sure. totally agree with you on that. And again, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm no doctor, I'm no politician, but, uh, you know, err on the side of safety because I don't want to miss two summers worth of concerts in a row. So let's nip this nonsense in the bud now uh, while we can. And yeah, props to everybody there in uh, Chicago land for, doing the right thing and uh, uh and getting things uh, uh back under control i hope so uh yeah because this weekend i was supposed to have been just a little bit north of you at rockfest in Cadott, wisconsin to be stage host and uh photograph things i was doing a number of uh, book signings for sonic warrior we were going to do all night signings including one right after the slipknot performance and you know all, all, all through last year when we first announcement uh, announced it. I'm like, oh, we're going to sell a billion books at Rockfest. It's going to be the greatest weekend ever. And now, you know, it ain't happening. But uh, as I've said many times before, if uh, Darla's hitting the, do you, excuse me one sec, do, you want to scratch and get out? <laughs> Go on. We know who's well, king of the house there. So, sorry about that. You know, Darla comes first around here. That's just the way it is. But um, I, I know yeah, um, like I was saying, if uh, having um, book tour appearances interrupted by the uh, virus is the worst thing that I personally have to deal with through all this, uh, I consider myself a pretty lucky guy because there's a, a lot of people who have been dealing with uh, far worse things than that. So, yeah, I was talking about this the other day and I would love to hear your uh, point on this. It has been the last concert I was at was at actually uh, the radio convention in Vegas, rock radio convention. But it was the Bush show. That was the last well, that was the last show I was at. And that was uh, four and a half months ago. Now, is this the longest run in your life that you can remember as an adult where you haven't been to a concert? Without question. Yes. Um, I attended my first concert 
December 6th, 1976, Madison Square Garden, uh, Black Sabbath with Ted Nugent opening. I saw my neck. Oh, yeah, maybe. No, th this is probably the longest stretch since early 1977. I saw my second concert, February of 77, Kiss with Sammy Hagar at Madison Square Garden. And then I don't know that I, I didn't see my third show until Labor Day weekend of 77. And again, you got to remember, I was just a little kid. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the Grateful Dead came to my tiny hometown of English Town, New Jersey. Now, this was an old colonial era town in central Jersey farmland and orchards. It's all, you know, this was years ago. It's all kind of built up now. But uh, back then, the, uh, the township only had two. And on every day week, 50,000 deadheads showed up and literally shut down the state of New Jersey. Uh, and when I've spoken to the Grateful Dead members through the years uh, about that show, they, they always got a, a blast out of the fact that I was the only person they ever knew who was actually from English town. But um, yeah, since, since Labor Day weekend of 77, this would be the longest stretch for me without a show. And I did not make that Bush concert because I had an, uh, a very early flight the next morning, like 3.30 uh, in the morning. And by then, I was already taking precautions for COVID um, for those of us who were in Vegas. And, and that, to date, is the only in-person public reading of Sonic Warrior that I've done. Um, but at that point in the U.S., the only place they were sure of a big outbreak had been Seattle. Uh, and I've read up a lot of, uh, about viruses and plagues. I always have. I, I'm kind of interested in rotten, bad things happening. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of maybe a, a little bit more clued into the history of these things than, than most folks were. So when I was in Vegas, I, I was taking extra precautions uh, already. Uh, and for many years now, uh, some people think I'm kind of weird and like Felix Unger from the old uh, uh, television show, The Odd Couple. But I always uh, uh, open doors by pulling my, my hand down into my sleeves uh, or with my elbow or I, I do elbow bumps with people, which I know seems like I'm kind of a jerk. But um, I, I used to get really bad bronchitis every year and I get the flu really bad. I smoked for many years. That didn't help. But uh, I found that in the years, the five or 10 years since I, I took more precautions, especially in cold and flu season, I've picked up a lot less stuff. It, it's not 100 percent sure but I've cut back on a lot of things. So I, I try to be more cognizant uh, of that. And it's gonna change the way people attend concerts. You know, hopefully this time next year, we're back to normal. Uh, but I think it's going to be a while till everybody feels completely safe at uh, any sort of uh, big uh, populated event. <laughs> I, think, I think we've all changed permanently. I find yeah. myself washing my hands more. I'm more aware. I think we all have gotten to a point where we're just more aware stuff we didn't even think about before. So I think it's good. We're all getting healthier from the situation. Yeah, yeah, and you should. And, uh, you know, it's it's funny, um, funny, not funny, really. But uh, when I look back at some of the chapters of the book, like the, uh, the opening chapter, which is uh, on that Black Sabbath concert I mentioned, the chapter is entitled The Time I Attended My First Concert and Threw Up on Carlos Sanchez who was my older sister Patty's boyfriend. And uh, I, I drank a bottle of Boone's Farm strawberry wine, passed out, Miss Black Sabbath woke up and puked all over him. And that <laughs> But uh, you know, you see the interactions between people at shows, or uh, the other thing I was gonna mention was, if you watch any concert documentaries these days, or even movies now, like old movies, and you see people walk up and like give each other a hug, it's like, oh, why are they hugging? You know, it's like the way we're, we're, you know, having our brains sort of rewired about personal contact. And uh, I, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a, I think it's a permanent thing in, uh, in many ways. And, and a lot of it's for the good. I mean, it'll, you know, people will be safer and, and um, you know, I suppose we'll talk music stuff soon, but I do want to make the point. Um, Japan is a place that, that has seemed to handle this pretty well. But the Japanese, because they live so uh, so packed in together, there's a, uh, such a, a large amount of people living on a relatively small landmass. Um, they are very used to not having the sort of personal space we're used to here in the United States. So when you get sick, when you get a cold, when you get the flu, you're expected to wear a mask. It's been that way since before you and I were born. 
Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you'll often, I, I've, I've more often than not um, seen folks over here wearing masks who uh, I later learned um, had traveled in Japan or, or picked up on how the Japanese did things. Again, it's no big deal to them. It's just what you do to keep from spreading germs around. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. But back at uh, a different time, I want to bring up, uh, we just had the anniversary of Live Aid which you got to attend and is featured in your book, Sonic Warrior, as you discuss that. Do you want to get in? Speaking of puking, I guess we, we can continue yeah, on. Yeah. We can continue on with uh, more throw-ups. How many times, how many throw-up stories are in the book, Lou? How many, how many, you know, how many, there, and I puked. <laughs> there are two major vomiting events in it, and there's some smaller ones scattered throughout. <laughs> uh, the two major ones are the uh, the opening chapter that we mentioned about Black Sabbath, and and as you know, and I've mentioned before, but but just to folks who aren't hip to the fact, the uh, the book is um, all separate stories. Each chapter is a separate story from my life, my music career, all the concerts I've attended, uh, and and uh, as you know, most of the time when you go to shows, it's it's boring. When you're backstage, there's guys with road. There's there's nothing going. There's, I swear to God, we're not trying to be cool about this. There's nothing going on, and and no. you do your interview and and all that. But sometimes crazy shit happens. So uh, th that's what the chapters in the book tend to be uh, uh, about: the crazier, more uh, out of the way things that happen. Anyway, because I didn't have pictures for everything in the book, I thought, well, I want a consistency to it. So I hit up my artist friend who I've worked with for many years, Alan McBain, and Alan did a. Uh, he's a brilliant graphic artist. And he did an original illustration for each chapter of the book, very Mad Magazine-esque. This is the illustration for the opening chapter, the time I attended my first concert and threw up on Carlos Sanchez. I know. The he does amazing work with these illustrations. He, he, and, and me holding it up here does not do it any justice. It looks so much better. Now, flashing ahead, because the book does not go in chronological order, the last chapter in the book, is the one that takes place at Live Aid. Uh, that is uh, entitled, The Time I Rained Vomit Down Upon the Biggest Concert in History. Now, I was just starting out um, professionally. I was working for uh, uh, the big rock station in Philadelphia, which was one of the original FM rock stations in all the United States. And it's the last one left of those originals. It's WMMR in Philly. And uh, having grown up in central Jersey, I got radio from both New York and Philly and all the Jersey stations. It was a, a it was a radio paradise. You just down the dial and there are tons of rock stations and the best DJs in the world. Uh, so this was one of my favorite radio stations uh, growing up. So the fact that I got to intern there and ended up working there was amazing. But about a year and a half into it, Live Aid was announced. And uh, since I was the youngest and stupidest and most gullible of the staff, I'm the one who said, sure, I'll go up in a helicopter. <laughs> so uh, I did two runs in a glass nose helicopter um, uh, that morning over the, the, this was held at JFK Stadium, which uh, if you're a college football fan, know, uh, it's where the Army Navy game was held for like a hundred years. Uh, it's no longer there, but it was one of these big brick horseshoe uh, uh, stadiums. And for a concert, they put like 110 to 125,000 people into this thing. So I was there for Live Aid. I saw the Grateful Dead there. I saw The Clash open up for The Who. Oh, I my God. Pink Floyd there. I, I saw just amazing, amazing concerts there. But Live Aid, of course, was the nuttiest. So uh, anyway, on the first run of the helicopter, my stomach was not used to it, and I hadn't really slept all night. We, we had been up prepping for the concert and the coverage, and uh, – uh, I end up starting to puke um, uh, down between my feet because uh, I got vertigo because it was a glass nose helicopter. So I'm looking down like thousands of feet into the stadium. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's, that's when this happened. <laughs> and uh, my puke rained down on the hundred thousand plus people who had all paid the, the ticket, by the way, uh, was an outrageous sum at the time. $35. I remember people going, you know, F that charity show. I'm not <laughs> damned if I pay $35 for a concert, you know. A 35 $35. Bucks. And and just name some of the artists that played that for $35. Oh, for Mick Jagger was there, Bob Dylan, 
Tom Petty, the Heartbreakers, Black Sabbath did a reunion, and Black Sabbath played at 10 o'clock in the morning. Oh, my uh, God. But, but as these charity things go, and again, this is just the American side. This is not counting what was happening over at Wembley Stadium in London, where I later was. I, I, of course, I wasn't there for Live Aid. Uh, I, I did make it to Wembley in 1991 or 92 for the Freddie Mercury tribute show. That was when Freddie, Mer Freddie Mercury had died of AIDS the year before, and uh, his bandmates in Queen wanted to give him a great send-off. Um, so uh, a number of bands did short sets in the first part of the day, Def Leppard, Metallica, Extreme, and they were brilliant. But then Queen came out, who, of course, stole the show at Live Aid. Uh, Queen came out uh, at Wembley, same stadium, uh, and they brought out all of these different vocalists to sing Queen song. So James Hetfield came out and did um, Stone Cold Crazy. Uh, Elton John with actual Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, they did a Mott the Hoople reunion. David Bowie sang, and it was just it was nuts. And and the thing about the 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 Queen um, uh, uh, that tribute show. Um, Maybe the best performance all day, and I'm not a particularly big pop music fan, George Michael, if you remember George Michael, did two Queen songs, one a Brian May tune called 39, which is on the Night at the Opera uh, album, a great science fiction song. Uh, and then he did the big hit, Somebody to Love with a choir. It may have been the best single song performance I've ever seen in my life. When we're done here, I urge everybody to uh, punch it up, George Michael with Queen. Uh, at the uh, Freddie Tribute show. That was amazing. And that Queen show will likely be uh, a chapter if I get to do a second book. Uh, the, the Grateful Dead concert that we mentioned before in my hometown of Englishtown, that will also likely be a chapter. These are just chapters I wanted to get in the first book, but we ran out of time. The uh, Grateful Dead chapter will be entitled The Time 150,000 Deadheads Dropped Acid outside of my uh, lonely teenage bedroom window. <laughs> oh, so, um, Did you see Grateful Dead uh, merch got into a new level today? Nike just put out Grateful Dead Nikes. Yeah, yeah. Line. Um, you know, it's, it's, I suppose it's the same thing that we're seeing uh, to a degree with Metallica and um, uh, bands that I grew up on, like the Ramones, where when these groups started out, they were they were outsider bands. They were they were the the, the friends of the friendless. They were you know considered um, um, just the, the 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 bottom rung of the entertainment world, and you know scary fans and all this. And and like anything else, through the years, things become accepted. And uh, what is the heavy music of today is the elevator music of tomorrow. How many times have you you know? literally gotten in an elevator and heard some rock song that that was badass when you were a kid and now you're hearing like dee 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 version you know it happens There's nothing to be ashamed of it's it's how the world works and it's how uh generations age it, it's just one of those interesting things in life so were you on rock radio when when acdc was considered too hard to play during the day where, where were there certain bands now that are so accepted that were day parted when you started by the time I got to radio, ACDC was uh, was on the radio. I do remember it being very difficult when I would call the radio stations to get them to play ACDC. Um, I had heard of them pretty early on, but I had not had a chance to see them until, I want to say it was 1979. I saw them the week that Highway to Hell came out. Um, they were the middle of the bill. This was another show I saw at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. This was the big indoor arena, the home of the Flyers for uh, for 40 some odd years. And I saw, I'm going to guess, four, five, six hundred different concerts there through the years. Because again, I had, I had radio years there where I was going there once or twice a week for concerts. Uh, anyway, the uh, the bill was Ted Nugent who was the headliner, he was on the Weekend Warriors tour. ACDC was officially touring If You Want Blood, You Got It, which was their first live album. And yes, Bon Scott was the singer. The opening band, the baby band for that show, doing the baby band 20-minute set was... Uh, 
the Scorpions. No. And, uh, and, and they, they had, they, I, I, again, they were a band I had heard of and, and you didn't hear them on the radio. Um, uh, but they, they had a great set, but at that point, I don't think they really spoke English. So in between every song, they would just say, Fear Scorpions, Fear Hitora. <laughs> and then they hit the next, they hit the next number. Um, uh, but they were fans. It was a great show. And I, I think that the ticket was $7.50. How the hell does your mind work? How do you remember years and ticket prices and everything for all the crap you've done after reading your book and the escapades and the adventures? And you still have a, you still have a lock memory. You got, you got a safe up there. I think I get it from my mom. Both my mom and dad are, are gone, and I love them dearly. They were they were two of my best friends. They were great people. Um, my mother, who was an antique book dealer, uh, she had what most people would call a photographic memory. Uh, I I would remember her. I, I would go to flea markets with her, and we'd be scrounging for antiques. And you know, I started collecting antique toys and looking for music stuff when I was like you know nine, ten years old. It's why my house and I, I have storage units filled and filled with stuff. Uh, anyway, my mom would see a piece of, of like depression era glass and she would look at it and I would, not that her eyes like rolled in the back of her head, but I'd see her like do this and she'd go, that's a 1922 piece of blah, 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 blah. And she would be quoting from a book she had read once on depression era glass 15 years before. Uh, my mother would also do the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle in 15 minutes in ink. That's true. That's a true story. So I only got a little bit of that, enough to remember stupid rock and roll stuff. My wife is always on me like, why can you remember you know, <laughs> yeah. the set list from 38 years ago, but you can't remember what I asked you four minutes ago? Mm -hmm. you know? I asked you for lemons at the grocery store. You can't I even remember that. lemons. You know, the speaker of the supermarket started playing an elevator <laughs> music version of HDBC and I forgot, you know. Oh. So as we talk about the Scorpions being a baby <laughs> band as being the opener back then, obviously you've been doing this for a long time, which Sonic Warrior, the tales of on the adventures of a rock DJ. If I was to ask you right now, today in 2020, are there certain bands right now that are considered maybe supporting acts or baby bands that you go, they got something. They're going to be oh, big. Yeah. They will be headliners. What do you think of your top three right now that if they're not on people's radar, they definitely should be? I think I think nothing more. I'm, I'm just going to name a few off the top of my head. I think Avatar is a band that has that potential. Nothing more cer uh, uh, certainly has that potential. Uh, and both those bands... I think I am very anxious to see in the future what they will do with their live shows and live productions once they start doing larger headline tours and get more money that they that I know they will immediately farm back. Excuse me into the uh, the concert staging because they both do incredible live events and they they do quite a bit of staging. But as headliners, they're they're you know club and small theater uh, size things. And you can only do so much on those budgets. When when those bands hopefully hit arenas, which I think is well within the realm of possibility, uh, I think they will both do incredible, uh, incredible shows. Um, other bands off the top of my head, you know, I, I think this new record from The Pretty Reckless could make them pop. You know, they've been a big band, but I think they could reach another level. I think Taylor Momsen is uh, she's a phenomenal front woman. She's a favorite person of mine to to uh, to talk to. And again, I'm I'm not claiming any special friendship with uh, with Taylor Momsen. You know, I know her from doing radio stuff. Uh, but like other people uh, that have gone before in the business, I, I I seem to have a pretty good rapport with her. I generally I, I like her, not oh I like her, but uh, I like her. I think she's super cool. She's a huge music fan. I think the reason why she and I chit 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 chit, chit so well is um, we're both music nerds, like serious, serious, fucked up in the head music nerds. <laughs> like, you, know, um, you know, she and I were both people who, um, 
uh, started memorizing Beatles album liner notes when we were six or seven years old. You know, her dad introduced her to the Rolling Stones, you know, when she was in utero, basically. Uh, she she's a big time music geek, and I, I think she's she's a pretty nice girl, which is uh, you know pretty down to earth, which is good for her because uh, you know you and I uh, are are used to dealing with her as uh, as a musician from uh, you know a, a pretty big band, but you and I are used to pretty big bands. I forget she's a huge actress. She's got like millions mm -hmm. of Twitter followers. Like she's huge. She's incredibly famous. You wouldn't know it from talking to her or uh, or meeting her. She is uh, she's really uh, uh, down to earth. I, I honestly, I, I think she she seems like a super cool person, and I love talking to her. I, I send her rare Beatles stuff when I can. I get like studio out to like here. Here's 19 hours from the Revolver sessions, and she's like, "Holy shit! I listened to the whole thing this weekend." You know. So. Yeah, I, I had her on the show a couple weeks ago, and she seems like she's in a really good place right now. Uh, she seems happy. She seems healthy. Yeah. She's really ready for the record. And like you said, just a genuine good person. And I can't wait to hear the rest of that record, especially since she put so much into it for Chris and more. Yeah. You know, they, the record was created under duress because some of the, the, the personal stuff behind the scenes. Um, but I, I think they positively use the bad to fuel good music you know, anytime, anywhere in life that you can take something negative and turn it into something positive, you're, you're, you're winning at life. Um, you know, I feel bad for Taylor and for the rest of the band and, and for all of these other groups that, that you and I are, are friends with that, you know, they have phenomenal new music and it's like, well, what the frig are we going to do now? Are we going to sit on this? Do we release a song? You know, Lejean called me at home not too long ago. And, and you know, Lejean from Seven Dust, and here's a guy I've known for 20 plus years and gave them the first national airplay. They were one of the first bands I traveled with. And, uh, you know, we were talking about them finishing the record. The new Seven Dust album has been done since the end of the last tour. They finished the last tour and just said, you know what, we're playing really good. Why wait to do the record? Let's do it now. Let's bang it out. And they did. And they thought, well, we'll sit on it till 2020 and then release it. And boom, it will have this great cycle. Well, now they can't release it. So now they're going to be sitting on it extra long. So that's why we got this um, Soundgarden cover because they, they, they had to do something. Uh, and, and it's a great song. It's a brilliant cover version. Uh, and and uh, it's especially good considering Seven Dust is a band who does not do a lot of covers, you know, for wow. around that long. They've, they've only really done a few that they've released. So, uh, you know, I, I feel bad for them. And again, all of these other groups, there's there's a whole lot of great music. And um, I don't want to mention I don't want to get in trouble because I get in trouble with this stuff sometimes. <laughs> there are a number of great artists who have some of the best records of their career that I've heard, that I can't say I've heard, that I'll never get to hear anything if I say I heard them. Uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of people sitting on a lot of really great music. Uh, that that much I can say, you can guess the rest. I've been down that rabbit hole too, and uh, I've gotten taste of some of the music that's out. And I say it all the time, yeah. uh, j just like us, they're sitting home and these artists, their brains don't turn off during quarantine. They accelerate. So as they're sitting home in quarantine, they're writing, they're recording. And when this is over, there is going to be a plethora of new music like we have never seen before. And I know yeah. there's going to be a long timeline for it. And I know they're pushing stuff back, but get ready for a lot of new music. Yeah. And I, uh, again, back to the original point here at the, the top of the conversation, you know, everybody has got to do everything they can to nip this virus thing in the bud now you've got to do all the little things now and again i'm i'm not trying to be political i'm not trying to be a doctor i'm just saying like your old pal lou who knows about rock and roll that's it listen i want to get back to concerts sooner than anybody else i know and and the soonest way is for everybody to to chill out and uh take every precaution even if you think they're stupid precautions take them anyway to be on the safe side it's not why not a big deal. yeah why not they're on the side of caution why wouldn't you all right, as we all celebrate today, Metallica broke the news, SNM2 officially. Uh, they recorded that back in September with San Francisco Orchestra again. We got two songs from it today and uh, a new single from Metallica. And they have a 
the box set you can get is ridiculous. Yep. They have colored LPs, black LPs, photo books. I mean, documentaries. It's Metallica. They come out swinging every time. But uh, one of the, my favorite chapters in Sonic Warrior is a chapter that not only as being a broadcaster and a rock radio DJ would be the most exciting trip I would ever be on. But for anybody that hasn't read the book yet, Lou, just give us a little background about you and that first conversation where your program director told you and you said, I'm going to do what? Give us give yeah. us a little bit. And, and, and let me preface it a little bit. Um, the Metallica guys have been super nice to me through the years. I don't know why. It's not like I go out, you know partying with them or anything, you know, but uh, uh, I, I've always been a fan and I've, I've supported them, I guess, as early as anybody has, but um, they, they've they made sure I, I've been at some some super good gigs of theirs. Uh, and, and some of those include, you know, I was at their, their performance at the Freddie Mercury tribute that I mentioned before. Uh, I saw them at Bonnaroo, but I also saw them the night before they played Bonnaroo. They played in the basement of a record store in Nashville. They played, there's, there's a great indie record store there called Grimey's. And there's a wine bar underneath it called Grimey's Basement. I, I don't remember how many people were there. Somebody said it was 300. I think it was more like 75 or maybe 100. Um, wow. So you're so close, like literally, like you're this close to James. There's no, there's no room. The, you know, it's a wine bar stage. It's this high. Um so I was there for that. Uh, I, I saw the first uh, s and show, uh, the s and one, where uh, the late, great Michael Kamen conducted for them, who did many phenomenal film soundtracks through the years, including one of my favorite movies, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. So I was there for that. There's a bunch of others I, I guess I could mention. But um, this concert we are referring to is uh, uh, taken care of in the chapter, The Time I Went to the Arctic and Got in a Mosh Pit, with a bunch of kids in polar bear fur while Metallica sang about sodomizing a goat. <laughs> and uh, this was uh, while I was working in Chicago. So this is 96, 97. Uh, and it was the Molson Ice Polar Beach Party. And, and let me find, um, here's how I'm going to read you the opening of the chapter. Oh, it was 1995. In the summer, if I read, if I read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Lou, you wrote the damn thing. I, once you read it, it's like, oh, man, I re you, you do 50 rewrites, and then you're, like, done with it. In the summer of 1995, I was hosting the afternoon drive shift at WRCX-FM in Chicago when I was called into program director Dave Richards' office to answer a question. Quote, how would you like to fly to the shores of the Arctic Ocean to see Metallica do a private show in an Eskimo village? I told him, quote, you got to get off the drugs, son. You got to get off the drugs. However, he was sober and sincere. The show, perhaps the most over-the-top publicity stunt for a beer brand in the history of mankind's long, slobbering love affair with alcohol, was to be called the Molson Ice Polar Beach Party. The plan was to pick 500 contest winners from across the United States and Canada, then fly them to the very edge of civilization for an invitation-only concert by Metallica, Hole, Veruca Salt, and Moist. G, a thousand miles from anywhere, triangulated between the fiercest metal band on the planet, Courtney Love, and man-eating polar bears? What could possibly go wrong? I immediately said, fuck yeah. <laughs> and that's the, uh, the opening of the chapter. Here's the, uh, the illustration for the chapter. There's Metallica on stage. Um, I'm trying Courtney, to... Courtney, of course. Here's Courtney with me down front. And then if you look in front of me, you might remember, uh, like, long timers there in Chicago. I used to uh, have a character on the air with me who was a talking alcoholic seal who uh, smoked cigars, Sammy the Seal. And there's Sammy the Seal. Sammy the Seal was actually there. Um, and um, yeah, Metallica flew us up to um, the, this Inuit village. And again, the correct term to use is Inuit. I, I purposely used the quote as it was said, uh, Eskimo village in the book. But then I later point out that that's seen as sort of uh, an, an incorrect term for the uh, 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 the uh, uh, indigenous people who live along the top of the planet. So uh, Inuit for the for the folks there uh, in that part of the world, and and they were super cool. Everybody who lived there, which was only you know a couple of hundred people, uh, because the roads didn't go anywhere. You you had to either fly there like we did, 
or you wait for the Mackenzie River to freeze and then drive 125, uh, 125 miles north from Inuvik, bang a right when you get to the Arctic Ocean, and then you pull into Tuck <laughs> It was how, how, how did Molson even find this place back then? You know, that, that's actually a really good question. Uh, here, let me put this back down for a second. Um, for several years before this, Molson did a, a, a contest only up in Canada, though. Molson is, of course, a, a native Canadian beer. Uh, they would do a Molson uh, um, uh, ice party or a Molson party. And uh, they would find some awesome out of the way spot in Canada. You know, one year they had something in Nova Scotia on the beach and they would they would go to different areas. The first year that they opened it up to the States was this year for Metallica. So they wanted to do something really over the top. So 1995, Metallica now has gone from an underground band. The Black Album comes out and I'm, they just become the biggest thing on the planet. It's 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 nuts. So I announced that I'm going to this thing and, and I'm going to bring a, a winner and their guest. And I was the only press person that the, the band invited up for this thing. And um, the response was crazy. So um, Molson, to answer your original question, this, thing, this kind of thing before, but never with bands this big and, and never um, open to the United States market. So it was, it was just insane. I point out in the chapter that, uh, you know, we got into Tuk Toyuk Tuk hours early. They flew us in just for that day. There are no hotels there. There's no place to stay. Uh, there, there's a school and a Royal Canadian Mounted Police outpost, and I'd gotten to know the, the Mountie there, Constable Dave Dirksen. I was putting him on the air every day with weather reports and stuff and, you know, talking about the, what's going on up there. Oh, you know, uh, we had a wolf come in town last night. That's the big news, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, anyway, we, we end up there for the day, and we're walking around before the show, and I just happen to be talking to some of the Mounties and, and some of uh, Metallica's management, and uh, another Mountie comes up and says, uh, oh, hey, uh, sorry to bother you, um, but um, some fans just flew here in a seaplane. They, 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 they rented a plane and a pilot, and they want to come to the concert. And I remember Metallica's management looked and said, are you fucking kidding? They rented a seaplane? You got you to understand, we are on the edge of, of nothing. Like, we're at the point in the map where it says, here there be dragons. Uh, and uh, uh, Metallica's management said, get their asses up here. Tell them to come on. <laughs> you didn't need a ticket. If you were there in the town, you just got to go to the show. Uh, so, it, you know, I, I've, I've been to thousands of concerts, and I've been to, a, you know, um, a lot of big ticket events and famous festivals and, and, and all this stuff. It's, it's part of the gig, and, you know, I'm just a professional music fan. That's what I always say. I'm, I'm just a professional music fan, so I'm, I'm thrilled to do anything. But out of everything, th this was really, really one of those shows where I thought, well, it just doesn't get any better than this. And, and maybe the best moment of the entire day was during whole set. Courtney is up on stage, and, and she, she was killing it. The, the, the band was great that day. Um, I'm in the crowd, and we're not packed in like sardines. There's room to move because it really relatively wasn't that many people. They, they had built like a, a modernistic, looked like a spaceship tent on the edge of Tuk Tuk Tuk. And there are plenty of entrances. You walk in and out. It was like going to something at a, you know, a state fair or something. And um, I'm watching Courtney, and I'm just smiling. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the greatest. Thing. And I'm smiling. I got this big, dopey grin on my face. And I, I turn to the guy next to me. And he's doing the same thing. He's spinning in the opposite direction with a big dopey grin on his face. And it's James Hetfield. Oh, my and, God. And now we can't say anything to each other. But we both had the same look on our face. And, and like, just for a second, he knew what I was thinking. I knew what he was thinking. Like, oh, my God, this is the coolest thing ever. And we looked at each other and just went like this. Mm -hmm. Just, like, got that, that, that grin that... Yeah, just and couldn't say anything. The music was too loud. Didn't say anything. Didn't need to. That was the best part. That that was honest to God the best part of the day, and and one of the best moments I've ever had at uh, all the concerts I've been able to go to. Do you still have a special place in your heart for Veruca Salt? Do you ever? A absolutely. <laughs> if you, you know, read the book, you'll know what I'm saying. Oh yeah. Well, you want me to read that part? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if your wife will be happy about it. I, I, you just beat me to it. My wife hates <laughs> that part of the book, and she <laughs> those things. Um, I got to find it. Oh, okay. So, uh, 
I knew Veruca Salt quite well as they were a local Chicago band. They were also my first on-air celebrity crush. I often wrote lovelorn poetry for the group's two singer guitarists, Nina Gordon and Louise Post, which I would read on air. This shtick would be the forerunner to my over the airwaves, mostly imaginary, okay, totally imaginary love affair with Lizzie Hale of Hailstorm years later. And by the way, L Lizzie was always in on the joke, as as was Veruca Salt. It was just, you know, mm -hmm. goofy stuff to put on the radio. And, and actually, there, there was a reason for it in both cases. Uh, I was a huge fan of uh, both bands, both Veruca Salt and Hailstorm, and wanted to do something extra to promote them. Because at, at that point, particularly for Hailstorm, they were a brand new band that, that you know, most people had not heard of. Um, so I wanted to find something where I could promote them, but it would be sort of entertaining. So I would do this goofy over the top in love stuff. And it was never, oh, I want to bang those chicks or anything. It was never like that. It was always like a forlorn schoolboy in love with his teacher kind of thing. Cause that, that was sort of goofy and fun. Mm -hmm. You know, later I remember both with Veruca Salt and especially with Hailstorm, th there were people in radio who were, were kind of doing things where they're like, uh, like some guy got on stage and I, I think said something to the, and please forgive me for the, for the, but I think this is a quote. Hey, how many, this is at a concert where the band is about to come on stage. How many of you want to Lizzie Hale? Come on, you know, man. Well, that's, that's just, you know, so it's one thing to go, I love Lizzie Hale and to read like a little love poem, you know, and, and it's yeah. sort of fun. And, and it gave me a chance to talk about the band, but then that other stuff started that that's when I stopped doing all that, that other, you know, stuff about, uh, uh, Hailstorm. Plus, I had done it for a while, so it was getting kind of old. So anyway, so anyway, back to the book and, and back to uh, I'm in love with the Veruca Salt. Not surprisingly, this did not go over really big with my wife, who sneering, who sneeringly referred to them as Veruca Sluts. <laughs> and I was thinking off the parts unknown with them went over as about as well as an egg fart in a crowded igloo. It led to some awkward conversations at home. What's for dinner, honey? I don't know. Why don't you ask your Arctic hump buddies to defrost some frozen whore food for you? <laughs> really uh, hey, hey, hon, hey, hon, feeling frisky? Not really. You should just try humping your northern snow trollops. <laughs> um, hey, hon, uh, who did John F. Kennedy defeat in the 1960 presidential election? I'm not sure, dear. Perhaps it was one of those guitar playing harlots you plan on finger banging when you get the fuck a slut stuck. <laughs> and by the way, I will point out editor's note, Lou's wife disavows each of the preceding quotes. He sticks by them saying, well, that's how I remember it. And that's, the, that's great. You guys, everything is in this book. Tales of rock and roll, tales of Lou's life. It brings comedy, it brings shock, it brings awe, and it gives you a behind the scenes look. As we should say, Lou, the way it used to be behind backstage. Because yeah. when, when did it when did it change? Where was the cutoff? Was it was it two thousand? Was it late nineties? Because I, I think the nineties it was still crazy. Two thousands everything you know, started calming down. That, that, that's kind of a tricky question because I think everybody thinks it used to be better back in some golden age. Because I remember the 80s. I, I first started as an intern at WMMR. I want to say it was nineteen. 81 or two and i was just a kid I, I i was barely old enough to drive and uh the djs these were guys who had started in the original fm rock radio heyday so you know they hated what rock radio had become back in 1982 they, oh man you missed it it used to be great it used to be fun you know and they would tell me stories about um and that was in 1982. They were telling you you already yeah, missed it. Yeah, you should have been here in 1975 when it was good. And and you know the guys who had been around since the 60s were going, oh, it sucked in the 70s. You should have been here. <laughs> so in the same way, it's and it's this way with music fans too, like fans who follow a particular band for a long time. Mm -hmm. We mentioned the Grateful Dead before. I started to go see them in in their very first the very first year I saw them. They had already been around for more than 10 years. 1977, which many people consider the greatest year the Grateful Dead ever had. The fans in 77 are like, oh, the band sucks now. You should have saw them in 67 when they were good. <laughs> and then, you know, 10 years later, 1987, I'm still going to see them. And like all these fans are like, oh, 
You should have saw them in 77. They were great in 77. They suck now. And, you know, it's just the same thing happens year after year. So it's the same thing with backstage. However, there, there has been a marked degradation of the amount of craziness that goes on backstage. There is a chapter in the book, and I, I think maybe this is what you're referring to. Uh, I want to say the title is, The Time I Was Backstage, and it was exactly like what people think backstage is, but never really is. Uh, and it's about being backstage at an OzFest. We were in uh, Camden, New Jersey, across the Delaware River from Philadelphia. And I was going to go out and watch Ozzy. And I was walking past Pantera's dressing room. And the door opened. And in a dressing room, which, you know, was just a you know, a pretty big dressing room, but but not like a huge room, just by dressing room standards at, a, at an amphitheater. And there must have been 50 people in it. Uh, Cheryl Valentine was there. Matter of fact, the next time you talk to Cheryl Valentine, you ask her, she was there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there's all these people crammed in the room, the bathroom. And now, of course I, well, Hey, I'm going in. Uh, and Wayne static. And I were like the only two relatively sober, non-crazy people in the crowd. I asked Sully Earn about it. Quote, I quote him in the book. He had a bottle. I think he, I, I talked to him about it a few weeks ago. I think he said it, he was drinking Johnny Walker then, but he said, are you, Anything from shows. whatever's has got to be true. I believe you, but I don't remember anything of it. Um, so yeah, uh, somebody had a tattoo needle going. The bathroom, there was a private bathroom off the dressing room. That door opened, and there was a girl in there bent over the toilet uh, who had her pants down. They were using her, and she had a nice ass, uh, but they were using it as a table for what I assumed to be cocaine. Uh, it was some, may maybe it was talcum powder. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I just stood there watching. Um, Dime came over at one point uh, and, and like looked at me and said, it's not your scene, is it, Lou? And I'm like, no, not really. And he goes... <laughs> Because uh, he offered me a drink, and I said, "No, nah, I got to drive." And he and he 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 laughed and said, "Ah, oh, don't worry about it, man. You'll probably outlive us all." You know. And then he went back into the the group of people. So uh, just amazing stories, amazing stories. Yeah, and there's some other like crazy, you know, the Hunter Thompson story. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's some shit in there. Uh, th there's a chapter entitled "The Time Snoop Dogg Got Me So High I Drooled in My Own Lap." Um, so yeah, the, the, there's, there's drugs in there and there's, there's a, some sex, none of it for me. Cause you know, <laughs> we're radio <laughs> DJs. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It's, it's all crazy stories, mostly built around concerts and, uh, you know, it's on sale now via Amazon. It's Sonic Warrior. My life is a rock and roll reprobate 20 bucks now on Amazon. You can get it wherever you buy books. You can, you know, if you can go to a bookstore, order it through a bookstore and give them the business, you know, and support. You got to support music stores. You got to support bookstores, and you got to support anybody in your area that you can safely, given all the vagaries of what's going on now. But you can also get it as an ebook, including Kindle, and there is an audio book. I read the book cover to cover, including the foreword by my dear close personal friend, best-selling author, Grammy winner Corey Taylor, and and that's really like I wrote some funny stuff in the book. Corey's foreword about me, which you know. <laughs> makes me look goofy uh, <laughs> it's really funny uh and uh i appreciate him writing that but anyway i read all of that in the audiobook at seven plus hours with uh with all the stories and uh all the stuff all right everybody pick up the book loubrutus.com is official website check him out nationally syndicated on hard drive xl and hard drive he's on rock radio all across the country pick up the book lou brutus sonic warrior loubrutus.com amazon Barnes and noble local bookstores Lou, you're the man. I swear every time I talk to you, I just get in a better mood. And that's what it's all about. Rock well, family. You, and and you, you, you know, you've supported me with the national stuff for as long as anybody. And I am greatly indebted, you know, of course, to the station for the support, but to you personally for being uh, so good to me through the years. And uh, I just feel bad that I have not seen you in person uh, in so long. You know, I, I would have seen you by now for, uh, for book tour. And I, I promise folks... I will do a book tour so long as we can all get through this and we can get back to doing stuff. Uh, you know, I, I had stuff lined up. I was going to be in Chicago. Uh, I, I had, you know, two weeks worth of dates. And again, book tour means, you know, I'm going to be out doing dates for like a year and a half. You know, I'll go to a certain area of the country and do appearances and then take a week off and then go to other places. But I will make it to your town and I would like you to come out and host the, uh, the book event for me if you would be so kind. 
I would love it. That'd be my honor, man. Something I'll always remember. Awesome. Great. Uh, and uh, yeah, folks can hit me up on social media, lubrutus.com. Um, and uh, also Darla, the wonder dog. Darla has her own Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So please follow those as well. And she's got all sorts of free autographed campaign merchandise you can pick up like postcards. We might eventually part with some of the lawn signs. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on to them for now though. Uh, or I might have to steal them back from my neighbor's yards. Lou Brutus, always the man. That's another edition of Rock On Studio Live. I can't thank you guys enough for hanging out with us. Remember to subscribe to the page, check out past interviews, and set reminders for a new one, and buy the book now. You don't even got to read it. All you got to do is listen to it. You got no excuses, and you got plenty of time. Thank you guys for supporting Rock Radio. Horns up, stay metal. I love you all. That's Rock On Studio. Peace, Peace. out.